Welcome to everyone. I would really like to have you uh, in better conditions than today. We are living in a struggle times and we are making our best to pass through all of these situations we are living. We are here today to talk about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict in the past, in the present, and in the future. It is not a new theme. It's a subject that is in all of us for decades now. Uh, we remember, we remember the conflict for a long, long past away. But now, since October 7, it's a new situation. And I think all of us are waiting for this struggle to pass. We are here because we need to talk about this situation. Because the because the camp feeling we are struggling is in here. We are talking about this kind of situations in academics, uh, round tables and conferences, because we choose this path. Well, today we are going to present this round table called Palestine Israel Past, Present and Future. Uh, we have four speakers. One, one of them is not present today, and I'm going to explain why. Uh, we have the honor to have Lubna Somali, Advocacy Manager at Badil Resource Center for Palestine Residency and, Regu and Refugee Rights. We are going to have Bruno Hoverman, Professor on International Relations and PUC in Sao Paulo, and Teresa Almeida Cravo, our colleague, Professor in International Relations at the Faculty of Economics at the University of Coimbra, PEUC and researcher at CES, Lubna. Uh, thank you, Sergio, and thank you everyone for, for joining us today and great appreciation for this uh, series on Palestine, past, present, and future. Um, in order to understand the present, what is happening today in Palestine, we have to look at the past. And we also have to look at the past and the present in order to determine what is best for the future, particularly when we, when we talk about Palestine. And in the last six months, there have been a series of um, commemorations, anniversaries, a lot of what we can call milestones, uh, even though milestones are supposed to be good things, these are not necessarily all of them good. So for example, this year we had the 30th anniversary of the Oslo Accords, which was on the 13th of September, 1993. So we commemorated 30 years of the Oslo Accords and the Oslo peace process. We also had the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, which was celebrated uh, by the UN, I think uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, interestingly enough, also, uh, 75 years of UN Resolution 194, which was on December 11th, 1948. If you're unfamiliar with UN Resolution 194, it is the one of five uh, resolutions that the UN has um, adopted and continues to adopt every year. Um, this particular resolution speaks specifically to the right of return of Palestinian refugees and internally displaced uh, persons. Uh, we are also commemorating 74, 75 years of ongoing Nakba, or in other words, we are commemorating 74 years, uh, 75, sorry, years of ongoing displacement and transfer of, of the Palestinian people and their denial of return. And also, uh, recently, uh, we commemorated the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people, which is on 29th of November. Um, and did you know that um, the 29th of November is also the day that the United Nations adopted UN Resolution 181, which is also known as the Partition Resolution. So it's, it's very um, ironic, uh, to say the least, that the International Day of Solidarity for the Palestinian People is the same day that the UN um, uh, adopted UN resol the resolution on partition. And I think that if history has taught us anything is that 
partition is never the answer. <laughs> um, it's never the answer. So since 1977, the UN General Assembly has uh, observed the 29th of November as the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. And it annually also commemorates uh, the partition plan uh, resolution, which was on the 29th of November, 1947, okay. Essentially, the partition plan serves as a form of legitimizing the Israeli colonial project imposed by colonial states at the expense of the Palestinian people, and of course, at the expense of our rights. Its commemoration constitutes ongoing violations of international law and the ongoing failure of the international community to fulfill its obligations to the Palestinian people. It essentially, in my perspective, adds insult to injury um, that the partition plan is commemorated annually as an act of international solidarity with the Palestinian people, while it contributed and still contributes to the ongoing Nakba. So essentially, the partition plan divided Palestine into three parts. 56% was allocated for the Jewish state, 43% for an Arab state, and then of course, an internationally administered Jerusalem. The partition plan designated over half of Palestine to one third, to less than one third of the population for Jews and Zionist colonizers. Um, of course, the partition plan was done absent consultation with the Palestinian people. Uh, this plan was designed by colonial states. It was rejected by the Arab states. And yet it came to decide the future governance of Palestine. So here we have international intervention uh, or interference is more like it to determine the future of a people and um, their nation state. Um, it was carried out by the UN and had blatant disregard for the Palestinian people's right to self-determination. So that didn't even consider or go into, uh, factor into the partition plan. Uh, the plan was eventually executed, implemented uh, by the Zionist movement and its militias, uh, who, uh, which this, these plan, what they did resulted in the forcible displacement of 750,000 uh, Palestinian refugees. In other words, 750,000 Palestinians um, were displaced outside of the area that came to be called Israel, while another 40 to 60,000 became internally displaced. That is displaced inside. Uh, the area that came to be called Israel. Against this background, the partition plan was a form of legitimization, international legitimization of the Israeli colonial project that, is, that was imposed by colonial states, again, at the expense of the Palestinian people. Eventually, why are we talking about the partition plan? Eventually, colonial states also imposed the two-state solution, uh, manifested by the Oslo Accords and the Oslo peace process, which in and of themselves contributed to further fragmentation, displacement, and entrenchment of the Israeli colonial apartheid regime. So the Oslo Accords, rather than establishing a semi-autonomous Palestinian governing authority and setting up a framework for further negotiations, the Oslo Accords did not achieve this ultimate goal of reaching peace and a final settlement between Israel and the Palestinians. Um, Badil uh, did uh, do a research on this uh, where we polled uh, Palestinian youth between the ages of 18 and 29. It's called uh, Palestinian Youth Perspectives on the Oslo Peace Process, Successes, Failures and Alternatives. You can find it on our website. One of the results of this survey uh, basically states that 92% of Palestinian youth indicated that the Oslo peace process is a failure, okay? Uh, so the vast majority of Palestinian youth in that age group uh, believe that already uh, the Oslo Accords uh, are a failure. 
The Palestinian youth also believe that the Oslo peace process has aided Israel in continuing its colonial apartheid enterprise unabated uh, in mandatory Palestine. Uh, this has come at the expense of, of the Palestinians of the Palestinian people's security, safety, economic stability, collective uh, identity, and the continued denial, of course, of our inalienable rights, most, sig most significantly, the right to self-determination and return. The Oslo peace process has contributed to further fragmentation of the Palestinian people, land, and economy. Israel's closure and permit regime, checkpoints, colony expansion, de facto and de jure annexation, all of them restrict freedom of movements of both people and goods inside and outside mandatory Palestine. This in turn has created sub-economies within the Palestinian economy, comprising East Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, West Bank, and the, and the Palestinian economy inside Palestine, 1948. So, the Oslo peace process essentially ensured that it functions as yet another channel to entrench the Israeli colonial apartheid enterprise, as Palestinian youth strongly asserted that the Oslo peace process has, has failed. An overwhelming 93% of them identify the expansion of Israeli colonies and as a manifestation of this failure with a staggering 80% of them perceive that the escalating implementation of discriminatory policies as another glaring example of this failure, among other uh, concerns. Accordingly, it is evident that the Oslo peace process goal as a whole was not peace <laughs> or a very skewed, let's say, understanding of what peace should be. Rather, it was keeping the process on life support for as long as possible and to resuscitate it whenever needed. Through this, Israel was able and continues to be able to manipulate that which is, that which is internationally unlawful into a de facto reality, which subsequently defers Palestinian rights of self-determination and return to the realm of fantasy. In effect, Israel utilizes the Oslo peace process as a mechanism to further entrench its system of domination over the Palestinian people by, one, offloading its responsibilities as the occupying power while expanding its colonial apartheid regime over the Palestinian people, forging an illusion of peacemaking to to um, neutralize the international community's concerns, such as the notion that any clashes between Palestinians and, and Israelis are perceived as temporary distractions and detractions, while perpetuating and exacerbating illegal facts on the ground, including the construction of colonies, colonizer-only roads, the apartheid wall, and so on and so on. The list, the list goes on and on. So three decades have elapsed since the start of the Oslo peace process. The ongoing Israeli impunity reinforced by the lack of accountability and international sanctions against Israel's blatant crimes and violations have continued to facilitate the undermining of Palestinians individual and collective rights, especially rights to self-determination and return. This not only underscores the failure of the Oslo peace process, but continues to entrench Israel's colonial apartheid regime as an ongoing status quo. So this has become the norm now, 30 years. Uh, Badil believes that reaching a just solution for the Israeli colonial apartheid regime requires enforcing a human rights-based decolonization approach supported by serious measures taken by the international community, third state parties, civil, so civil society and solidarity movements in order to ensure the full realization of our inalienable rights, namely, of course, our right of self-determination and return. So going back to solidarity and, and what uh, 
what we as Palestinians expect true international solidarity to look like. Um, international solidarity with the Palestinian people is should be implemented in a way that they or we ourselves define as necessary. And it must serve the fulfillment of our inalienable rights to self-determination and return. So true solidarity requires taking direct actions to end the Israeli colonial apartheid regime and the systematic and widespread international crimes it commits against the Palestinian people. It starts, of course, with holding Israel accountable through sanctions in order to dismantle this colonial apartheid regime, and of course, taking further measures, practical measures, to decolonize Palestine. Genuine solidarity with the Palestinian people means recognizing their struggle for liberation by all available means and supporting that struggle. So in the midst of the Israeli genocidal war on Gaza, solidarity with the Palestinian people, of course, is even more vital and must reiterate and amplify the Palestinian people's short-term demands of enforcing a comprehensive and permanent ceasefire, which includes the withdrawal of Israeli forces from the Gaza Strip, providing unrestricted and unconditional humanitarian aid, preventing additional displacement and ensuring international protection for Palestinians, and of course, ending the 16 year blockade on the Gaza Strip. Measures to bring about these demands and put them into practice are of the utmost urgency and constitute the bare minimum, the absolute bare minimum required by international law. True, solid, true solidarity also means supporting the struggle for Palestinian liberation and challenging the demonization of acts of solidarity with the Palestinian people. Um, I'm sure that you have uh, been seeing how certain states have been suppressing international solidarity movements and actions by arresting people, by accusing them of, anti of, of being allegedly anti-Semitic, that any true act of solidarity with Palestinians is anti-Semitic. Um, there is legislation being passed by various countries as we speak, uh, banning of the Palestinian flag, banning of the Palestinian kafiya, all sorts of things that are, that, that are happening. Um, so falsely equating criticism of Israel and solidarity with Palestine as anti-Semitism and colonial mechanisms that are aimed at shrinking the space for Palestinian civil society, such as the imposition of conditional funding and the delegi delegitimization or criminalization of all forms of Palestinian resistance and the demonization of the Palestinian people, of course, this is not uh, solidarity. Um, acts of solidarity with peoples can never be through violating their rights, uh, silencing them, delegitimizing their pursuit for liberation. In the case of the Palestinian struggle against the Israeli colonial apartheid regime, solidarity must mean refusing any measure aimed at eliminating Palestinian space, whether it's geographical, starting with the partition plan, or the civic space for expressing and defending Palestinian rights. As such, not only should states remove their conditional funding clauses, they should also take measures to decolonize funding. And of course, states must fulfill their obligations to support the struggle of the Palestinian people to self-determination and hold Israel accountable for its international crimes through, thanks, through sanctions. So in other words, we would prefer that the UN take back their International Day of Solidarity and implement practical measures that get us on the right path to actually exercising and fulfilling our rights to self-determination and return through a comprehensive decolonization approach. And I will stop there. Thank you, Lyubna. I think it's very interesting for us. Uh, as, as you said, we need to fight not only against these situations, against a colonial narrative that presents this conflict as an equal conflict, uh, a conflict between equals. And in, in that case, that presents the idea of everyone involved is equally, uh, uh, it's 
if 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 they call it for what's happening. I I think it's really really important what you are saying, and I and I believe there are going to be some questions and some some commentaries on on further on further section. So I am going to give the word to Bruno Hoberman, professor of international relations at Book in Sao Paulo. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank Lubna for her speech. It was really amazing to hear through time and Sergio and Teresa for the invitation to be here talking to you. Uh, I'm talking straight from Sao Paulo, Brazil. So for me, it's summer right now. And um, it's a great pleasure to, to be talking to you, although the circumstances are really terrible and unfortunate what's been happening in Palestine. And I'm, I will try to, to say a couple, I, I'm gonna reaffirm some things that Lubna has said and try to contribute to the debate uh, as the way I can, as the, in the way I can. Uh, so, first of all, uh, we are talking about the 30 years of the Oslo Accord, as Lubna has reminded us, and <clears throat> I believe from my, from my studies and from my perspectives uh, that the, the, the peace process is not a, a fraud in itself in the, from the beginning. Uh, when we look at, for example, the Madrid conference was a really important event and a really important uh, opportunity to discuss a, a regional peace. And I believe when we should discuss uh, a political resolution in Palestine, it should, it should be a, a regional one. It should involve every country in the region uh, because uh, Israel is not uh, a settler colonial enterprise against only Palestinians, but through this, uh, his military doctrine of the, 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 the Iron Wall, right? Uh, it has been confronting military, uh, every country in the Middle East, in the, the Levant uh, region, uh, since its, its uh, establishment in 48. So uh, through this last couple of months that uh, we saw the genocide in Gaza, we, all, we also saw bombings in Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, and we haven't saw in, in, in Jordan because the Jordanian government is like <laughs> friends, really friends with the Israelis. It's a different uh, 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 arrangement that they have with the Israelis, but uh, we could also, right? Because we are seeing Jenin and we saw really big demonstrations in, in Jordan these past weeks. So we could be, it, it could be happening in Jordan also. Right, so uh, every country, every country in the region is, should be involved uh, 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 in this agreement because uh, uh, it's how the 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 central colonial enterprise it works through the imperialist uh, uh, actions of the U.S. and a, a free Palestine it should involve a free Middle East. The Middle East, we, uh, when, back in the 60s, right, there was this discussion between uh, uh, the PLO, the Palestinian National Movement, and Arab nationalism, Pan-Arabism, uh, and Nasser, right, that the Middle uh, 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 United Arab, uh, uh, Middle East with United Arab countries with free Palestine. And the Palestinians would say no. Uh, a free Palestine will unite the Arab countries, right? And this was this debate between Nasser and Arafat back in the 60s and other, uh, and other uh, Palestinian leaders. And this must be in the, in the, uh, back in the, in the table when we discussed the, the freedom of Palestine, I believe. Uh, for this reason, I've been uh, uh, claiming uh, with a partner uh, that I've been writing with, Sabrina Fernandes, here from Brazil. Uh, she's from Alameda Institute. And we have just published an article uh, on international solidarity uh, with Palestine towards the, uh, the colonial agenda. 
because I totally agree with Lubna. We, we should stop talking about a true state re resolution through what's been discussed in, in this past 75 years, right? Because uh, the, the partition is a British idea that was adopted by the international community and the Zionist uh, uh, leadership back in the 40s. They accepted the partition as a, a method to conquer the, the entire Palestine. Uh, so it's a settler colonial imperialist idea. And we should be really my, uh, 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 conscious about this. And back in, in 1988, the Palestinians accepted this, this imperial idea as a way to, to have something, right? Because the, the conditions after 40, 5, 50 years of resistance, uh, and the end of the Cold War, the end of the, 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 the solidarity that we saw during the Cold War, uh, and the, the Intifada was a really important moment, and the Palestinians finally accepted the, the, the two-state uh, uh, resolution and, and said, yeah, let's do it, right? Uh, we are giving we are we are we are giving you seventy percent of the the land, and we're accepting twenty two percent of the land. Uh, is Jerusalem is our capital? But when we discuss what uh, uh, was written on paper on the Oslo Accords, when we see, for example, the Geneva Initiative from two thousand and four. Uh, because here in Brazil, I don't know, I, I would love to hear from, from you that uh, the discussion, because here in Brazil, we are affected from, from a different uh, propaganda also, right? Uh, but the Zionist lab, for example, here in Brazil, they say, uh, ah, we are for the, the two-state resolution and the Geneva Initiative is our uh, 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 framework. And I went to read the, the, the Geneva resolution. It's a better... It's better than the Oslo Accord. You discuss uh, 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 the return of the refugees, uh, Jerusalem as a capital, maybe it's it's on the table, uh, you settle on the frontiers, and you exchange, uh, uh, there's land exchange, right? And this is a problem, but OK, you can accept it. But uh, then I went to, to read further. and. Uh, 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 the, the Geneva Initiative says the building of a Palestinian state, but then they say no military. It would be established a multilateral force uh, 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 from the, the so-called quartet that back on, on the 2000s, 2010s would be uh, the, the UN, the EU, uh, U.S. and Russia, right? We could say, oh, a new quartet nowadays. Okay. But what, what we are discussing here is a substitution of the, the occupation force. Because uh, 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 what we are saying here, the most leftist part of the Zionist uh, 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 movement is saying no sovereignty for the Palestinians in the framework that we accept as the best. And this is what uh, uh, Yitzhak Habin said in, 2000, uh, in 1995, when he went to the Knesset after the, the, the Second Oslo Accords and said the Palestinian entity, he said this, would be less than a state. And the representative of the Netanyahu's government said to this British uh, a guy that interviewed everyone, they interviewed Bastin from the, the Egyptian comedian the other day, and he interviewed the, this, this Israeli representative, and he said, it's like I've been never uh, 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 committed to, the, to a real sovereign Palestinian state. He said this. So a representative of the Israeli far right who killed Itzhak Habin, saying Itzhak Habin never committed to a Palestinian, full, a full Palestinian sovereign state. So the entire Israel establishment is not committed to a full uh, sovereignty on West Bank and Gaza. Uh, so we cannot discuss a two-state resolution because the Israeli entity is a settler colonial entity based on the continuous expropriation and disenfranchisement and expulsion and death and confinement, and it's built on the negation of Palestinian self-determination on their own land. 
is built is is built on the uh, uh, the separation of the Palestinian people and the Palestinian land. It's impossible to uh, to discuss a two state solution while Israel is the settler colonial ethno national state that it is today. Uh, a, a really important way to understanding what is this two state solution is just to hear the Zionist left because they're really interesting and I, I love the Zionist left too. For me, it's, you say how you see how hypocrites they are. And for example, there was this movement back a few years ago. It, it was international movement of the Zionist left, but they were based in, in Latin America, Brazil. And the, the name of the movement was Save Israel, stop the occupation. Do you understand what they're, they're saying here? They're not saying save Palestine, stop the occupation. They say save Israel, stop the occupation. They're not committed to Palestinian freedom. They're not committed to Palestinian rights. They're not committed to Palestinian self-determination. They say, ah, we are Zionists that are pro-Palestine. It's impossible to be a Zionist pro-Palestine. But the international committed community is it's trapped in the Zionist left idea of a two-state solution that uh, uh, the Israeli state would uh, uh, commit itself with a, a Palestinian state and would respect a Palestinian state. And if the international community to support the Zionist left, a Zionist left government, we can reform the, the Israeli state and we will respect a Palestinian state. It's impossible. In the same way that it's impossible that the Brazilian state respect a sovereign Indian indigenous nation or indigenous state here in Brazil. It's impossible. Tomorrow, today, if the indigenous nations of Brazil start reclaiming their sovereignty over the land and a sovereign state here in, in, the, in their lands, in the Amazon, in the center, uh, east of Brazil, everywhere in Brazil, in the Northeast, here where I live, but the Brazilian state wouldn't accept it, of course, because that's a colonial state. As the same way the US then, uh, doesn't accept when the indigenous, uh, the Lakota people, the Lakota nation reclaim their land. Of course, because they are all settler colonial states. And the international community is based on settler colonialism. Right? So they always defend the settler colonial claims. The settler colonial uh, 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 concern on security. Because the settler colonial concern on security is Palestinian resistance, anti colonial resistance. resistance. And for example, the Geneva Convention, the Geneva, Geneva Initiative. And, and when they say this, the, the Zionist left and the, the more moderate leadership everywhere, ah, we are for the two, two, two state solution because in this way we can respect uh, the two, uh, uh, the claims, the national claims of the two peoples. It sounds like a fair resolution, right? Because we have two peoples over a land and you create two states, of course, we are being fair, we are being moderate, right? It sounds reasonable. But uh, 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 people never discuss Palestinian security. It's, ne it's never a, a matter of discussion. Who is killing who here? Who is a, a real threat to the other here? Who is committing a genocide? So when we are seeing the, the, the genocide going on in Gaza, uh, the Zionist left starting start uh, this debate. Oh, Palestine free from the river to the sea is a, it's a genocide commitment to expel all Jews from the land. Who expelling who from the land right now? And, and it's been like this from forever, right? What's on the ground? It's one thing. And the discussion on media, on the government, on the academia is another one. So the, the cultural debate is centered here. And uh, this is the reason why debates like this is it's it's central, because uh, 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 we need to discuss the, to change the way we understand reality on the ground, to change the way we understand uh, 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 how we can uh, uh, be in solidarity with the Palestinians. And my time is up, Sergio. This is why you, yeah, right. So uh, uh, so, so just to to. To end my the, my 
my presentation, uh, uh, um, to recognize the Palestinian Authority, like the, 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 the Spanish prime minister did, is not real solidarity with the Palestinians. Because uh, his minister, uh, I don't I don't remember her name, that she was expelled from the government, apparently for other reason, Yoni Belaha, I don't remember her name, but it was something like this. Uh, she was totally committed to Palestinian solidarity and was defending uh, 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 the Caesar, the cut of the relationship between Spain and Israel. And this is the main thing that we can claim, reclaim right now, that our states and their relationship with the Israeli state. To commit to sanctions, BDS, you need to, we need to go to the S right now, sanctions on Israel. It's what the Yemeni people are doing, the Houthis are doing. They're not doing this, uh, uh, only cutting the, the, the uh, uh, so we, they, they don't have the power of the US, right? To, 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 uh, uh, expel them from SWIFT, for example, but they can't stop uh, 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 trade on the Red Sea. So this is sanction, and this is popular sanction. And, and if our government is not committed to real sanctions, we can demand real sanctions. Military embargo. Brazil is, is one of the greatest uh, importers of military uh, uh, arms and from Israel in, in the history. So Lula is saying, oh, the Palestinian people, genocide. Blah, blah. Lula seems a really nice guy, right? Everyone loves Lula. But he's, he's not stopping uh, doing a military embargo on Israel. He's against a military embargo on Israel. Because to do a military embargo on Israel, we must confront our own military. And our own military is a real problem for us because our own military wants to do a coup here in Brazil, right? So it's a really a big, big problem for us. Uh, so this is it. We need to, to start discussing real solidarity with the Palestinians, and this means sanctions. This is what solidarity means nowadays to, to move toward decolonization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruno. I think the people of, I think the people of Latin America and other colonial parts of the colonized parts of the world can perfectly understand this situation. Mexican government uh, are actually condemning both parts and really, I mean, our government is a left-wing government and all the people in the right wing in my country are starting, ah, you know, the Mexican government is supporting Palestine. But the government is actually in a really middle situation because they don't want to break relations, international relations with Israel. Not for Israel, but because USA is the most important uh, relation of Israel and government. And we, we know we are going to have problems if we make that. I mean, it's a, it's a really problematic situation for the people of Latin America. I think both Brazil and Mexico have, and Colombia, we are the three countries we try to make something else. And we, are, we were stopped by USA in the recent past. Now, I am going to. Ah, I am going to present Teresa Cravo. I think I don't need to present Teresa Cravo. She is a professor of international relations at the Faculty of Economics, at the University of Coimbra, Peru, and she is a researcher at Center for Social Studies of our university. Thank you so much, Sergio. Um, I wanted to. First of all, um, thank you for um, chairing and representing so well the PhD community at SESH. Um, let me also thank Lubna for making the time to participate in this event in a moment when solicitations of her time must be quite significant. So thank you so much for dedicating this, this um, time to us. Uh, also very special thanks to Bruno for literally pushing forward his holiday break to be here with us. It was very kind of him and I'm very appreciative of his gesture. Um, so I'm going to talk about my evolution in understanding and teaching the Oslo peace process from a peace and conflict perspective. Um, 
And so I want to discuss with you not just how the Oslo Accords were initially framed and how its representation sort of evolved within the field um, that I consider myself a part of, but also how my own position changed from my initial perceptions of the process. Um, so there's a there has been a sort of internal reckoning for years within myself that I want to share with you. So the, the initial framing of the Oslo Codes was one of extreme optimism. And in that, it accompanied most mainstream accounts at the time of the moment of the signing of the agreement. Um, let me give you an example. On, on September 13, 1993, the New York Times announced in, and I quote, in a triumph of hope over history, Isaac Rabin, the Prime Minister of Israel, and Yasser Arafat, the chairman of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, shook hands today on the White House lawn, sealing the first agreement between Jews and Palestinians to end their conflict and share the holy land that they both call home. And the themes in the media, but also within peace and conflict studies, were very much about hope over despair, peace over war, closeness over distance, negotiation and compromise over intransigence and conflict. And many did expect the Oslo Accords to usher in a new era for Israelis and Palestinians. So three decades after this sort of historical handshake, the goals of the Oslo Accords, in a way, in the positive light remain unfulfilled, in the most negative light were exactly what they were meant to be. But in the reality, violence continues. There's no actual diplomatic agreement on the ground and Israeli occupation persists. So I guess I wanted to start with questioning why the initial optimism. So let me explain why the label of success was sort of initially attached to the process. For several reasons. So the first one has to do with the post-Cold War sort of end of history moment. So there was um, a great optimism regarding the end of the Cold War and the resolution of long-standing armed conflicts like the one in Palestine and Israel, um, regardless of the wider context of occupation, but the fact that there was an armed conflict that needed to be in a way solved and that demanded the international community's intervention. And there was a great optimism in this, in what was in fact an era of global interventionism and Palestine and Israel were pretty much part of that process. So the idea was that there was a uh, an, an environment, an international environment that was permeable to sort of finally finding a solution to the um, Palestinian and Israeli conflict. So there was also, besides that international context, particular aspects that were important here. So in the US, there was the coming to power of the Clinton administration, which had a very clear sort of political wish to um, get involved and um, pursue several interventions at international level to the with the purpose of ending international conflicts. Um, you also had the OLP that was quite weakened because of the war of the, uh, of the first Gulf War. So the fact that it got too attached to Iraq's, um, Saddam, Saddam Hussein's um, occupation of Kuwait. And so it was quite fragile in terms of its uh, public opinion. And it needed sort of a third party to get together and re and find um, some sort of common ground with Israel to start a negotiations process. And in Israel, you had the Labour Party that was supposedly from June 1992 presenting itself as having a mandate towards peace. You also have in the background the fact that the Madrid um, peace process, even though it had the advantage that Bruno mentioned, which was the fact that it regionalized the situation and was involving also the other regional um, Arab countries, it seemed that it wasn't going nowhere at that point. So and it wasn't really proceeding much. And so it was sort of generally assumed that there was a need for another attempt at solving the conflict. And the Oslo peace process has sort of that light from the beginning. Oh, finally, we have something here that we failed prior to this moment. There is also this um, very important uh, aspect that was attributed to the mutual recognition of the two parties. So the fact that you finally had the authority, which was the Palestinian authority, um, that was at the time read as sort of a nascent quasi-government that had been created by the Accords. So the Accords were credited for finally giving credibility to the other side. And also don't forget that this was quite important from a perspective of a, the global image of the PLO, which was in many aspects just still very much considered a terrorist organization. So 
this was seen as a great accomplishment that we were finally sort of recognizing that the other interlocutor on the Palestinian side had equal standing and was important. I will get to why there was no equal standing here, but that was kind of the, the light that was in. There was another issue that was really, really exciting for peace and conflict studies, which was track two diplomacy that came, that was how the uh, Oslo process came through. So this meant, or track two diplomacy or back channel diplomacy is the practice of non-governmental, informal, sometimes unofficial clandestine contacts and activities between private citizens, uh, NGOs, academics, you know, basically what, what was not official governmental diplomacy that we were used to. And so the fact that the Oslo peace process had that sort of um, diplomacy, track to diplomacy going on that actually succeeded at the end in signing an agreement was understood within the field of peace and conflict studies as a major, a major, major achievement. And it was also sort of used as an example from then on in several occasions, as in, you remember Oslo track to diplomacy and how it worked. So there was, there was also the thing about having been um, secret negotiations. So there was a lot of advantages that were spoken within the field of peace and conflict studies about how the advantage of the media blackout was really important because it basically allowed the parties to negotiate free of pressures from the public opinion, free of pressures from eventual extremists. And so it was almost conceived as, you know, this clandestine secret negotiations were really important for to guarantee that there was enough space for the negotiations to happen. And in and here there was always a lot throughout the years, there was always a lot of comparisons. So for instance, I remember there was a very clear comparison with the Camp David of 1999 peace negotiations between Ehud Barak and Yasser Arafat, which had an almost 24 seven direct connection to the media. It was so, 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 so sort of in, our, in everyone's TVs that it became really vulnerable to the pressures of the respective public opinions. And so it was at the time even said, see why secret Secret negotiations have these advantages that these other negotiations don't have. So this is all sort of putting the Oslo process into a very, very positive light in what concerns um, the process itself. And it was also supposedly more rapid, even though there were like 13 rounds of negotiations in Oslo, it was still considered, you know, quicker because there were no, no need for huge diplomatic protocols and speeches and all the effort was in the real, supposedly real negotiations. Um, I know there was also a very sort of small team for the negotiations. It had an important partnership with NGOs that knew the field and had a deep connection to the conflict, et cetera, et cetera. The contents also seemed sensible. So the idea of Oslo, which was part one, part two, etc., was we do first the basic, which is the mutual recognition, we build trust, and then we move on to the harder issues, borders, refugees, Jerusalem, afterwards. And this was presented in a very much, you know, we can't just put the two discussing Jerusalem. That's going to block everything. It's not going to happen. So let's just do, you know, the Oslo process has a rationale that seems sensible. Um, so this is sort of the first idea I wanted to, to give you, which is the Oslo process want, or the appreciation of the Oslo process from an international perspective and even from a peace and conflict perspective was mostly in terms of the mainstream sort of shown in a very, very positive light. Now, this doesn't mean that there wasn't a critical literature within peace and conflict that looked at the Oslo process and saw immediately a lot of problems, but that wasn't the sort of the major representation of the process. So here are some of the problems that were already considered at the time and that what has happened is that they've gained weight, I think, in the way the Oslo process has been evaluated in the, in the you know in the, for the last three decades. One of them is that the Oslo process actually assigned a really, really huge role to the international community. And the international community completely failed to fulfill that role in the manner that it was supposed to. Um, and very especially, it assigned a considerable role to the United States. So the Israelis and the Palestinians negotiated the accords in this era where there was increased international involvement. Um, but the accords themselves, they were actually predicated on the availability of international resources and international experts and international support. So there was basically everything needed to work 
in the particular manner in which the international community was completely vested in maintaining sort of the promises and the concessions that were made part from one part to the other. Um, this, on the other hand, meant that what happened was not exactly this, and it was pretty much the international community maintaining what became sort of an indefinite transition. So the, 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 the parties basically were in their respective ways undermining the establishment of the Oslo process for several reasons um, and not in an equal standing at all. But there was but there were basically spoilers at both ends. And the international community pretty much gave from the beginning unconditional support to Israel and placed the idea of the spoilers mostly at the Palestinian side. And of course, there was there were Palestinians on them. There were spoilers at both sides. But the intervention that was supposed to help build trust and to actually allow Oslo to go into a situation of two state solution, etc., which was at the time the solution considered more favorable at this point is from most sort of critical studies is not, um, but at the time was considered the most favorable situation. It largely depended on the support from the international community and the international community sort of created the situation in which the spoilers were all, all on the sort of Palestinian side and the Israeli were pretty much allowed to not only not fulfill the promises in Oslo, but actually to take advantage of the Oslo process to continue this sort of indefinite transition, which meant further and further occupation of the territory of, of Israel, of Palestine. Um, there was also other, um, so there's, there's this other aspect is that there is there was a very clear, really, I think, wrong understanding of spoilers that sort of split the blame between the two sides when that wasn't actually what was happening on the ground. Um, then there was the problem of replacing the categories of occupied and occupier with the framing of partners for peace. So Palestinian Authority and Israeli government became partners for peace and the partner invoked a symmetry that was absolutely not there. And so the language of occupation sort of disappeared from the peace process because the peace process was about the armed conflict. And there's a lot to be said about calling this conflict, etc. Of course, there is a conflict in the sense of there's an armed conflict happening. Um, but the Oslo process actually helps to remove this idea of a symmetry by placing both actors as partners in peace. Um, and so that language was is now being recovered. But for a long time, I think it was because of Oslo that it wasn't at the forefront of our understanding of the conflict. The other aspect um, that was also mentioned at the time and became kind of clearer was the lack of appropriation of the accords. So not just because some people actually saw in the accords the real the real problem that was going to have that was going to happen and that we witnessed throughout the years, which was the fact that the Oslo process was allowing the occupation not only to persist but to actually um, to advance. But, but also from a, you know, what had been sort of seen as in a very positive light, the secret negotiations, the fact that it was done by track to diplomacy, et cetera, also meant that there was no appropriation of the of the process on the part of the citizens. So they were never actually invited to part, to participate in the process. They weren't heard in terms of what they what they thought about the process. And so it was quite um, damaging at a certain point for the process itself to not have on board any sort of support from the population at both ends. And we have, in this situation, there is a certain optimism at the beginning, but the support really wanes quite, quite um, fast. Um, so the the reckoning here, I think, is because is is has to do with the fact that there were some issues about the Oslo process that could have turned out differently. So we could have some sort of um, you know, counterfactual history and say that if the international community were to have understood the Oslo processes and its dangers in a particular manner, that the structure of the agreement itself, the structure of the first part of the agreement, which said, okay, let's start with the um, proximity, you know, bringing the parties together, discussing what needs to happen for the two-state solution, et cetera, et cetera, that this could have indeed been the beginning of something that would have turned out um, with the creation of the two states as opposed to the situation we have now. So I don't think this is in, in, in conclusion. So I don't think the issue in itself is the empty sort of apparatus of Oslo is 
the perception and the understanding that the Oslo process sort of put to the fore that was incredibly misleading in terms of what is happening on the ground and also created a situation in which Israel was allowed to undermine the process as much as it wanted, whilst the blame kept come, kept being on the side of the Palestinian actors and using the Palestinian actors as basically a scapegoat for the fact that the Oslo process wasn't, wasn't working. Um, so I think there was a framing here um, of whichever sort of peace agreement that could have been negotiated that was the problem from the beginning. So it's not the structure itself that is the problem, in my opinion. Um, there are issues in the Oslo agreements that had to be there in any agreement, even if it didn't um, appear the same way as Oslo did, because there were issues that needed to be sorted, that needed to be negotiated. So it's not so much that aspect of the Oslo Accord. I think it's the, the whole understanding of the situation that is reflected on the Oslo Accord, and then that places the international community in a particular position of allowing one of the parties to completely instrumentalize the process to its advantage and to the advantage of its um, political purpose, which was ultimately the political purpose of maintaining and, and you know, furthering the occupation. Um, so I'll leave it at there because Sergei has already raised his hand. Thank you so much.